The Valley of South Park opens up expansive and green as Highway 285 slides down from Kenosha Pass in central Colorado. I looked out. I was taking deep breaths as I surveyed it all, and I was smiling. I had great camping weather. I had a brand new tent and a brand new sleeping bag. All was right to the, with the world. Then my cell phone started firing off alerts. The New York Times, the BBC, Al Jazeera America, NPR. That's how I found out a week ago Wednesday about the shootings in Charleston. Psalm 130 may have been written during the Babylonian exile four or 500 years before the birth of Jesus, but it was well suited to that Wednesday evening. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. A lament, such a lament. The lament as David lamented over the death of Saul and Jonathan. The cry of such great need and anguish. Out of the depths prayed the psalmist. We can imagine a watery depth. The sea was the abode of Leviathan in the time of Jesus. The sea was a place of great danger and of scariness. The sea was where you did not want to go. The psalmist may have been referring to the depths of the sea. The psalmist also may have had Sheol in mind, the abode of the dead. Not hell as we think of it, fiery and torturous and Dante, a place of torment, but rather the place of departed souls, the souls that are completely cut off from the souls here on earth. There is a barrier between here and Sheol that is a barrier that cannot be crossed. Can you feel, can you hear that sense of isolation that sense of alienation between here on earth and Sheol. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Now, I admit that I was out of the loop, the news loop, for most of the breaking news last week. But I suspect that Psalm 130 was on the lips of many a week ago Wednesday night, and then the following days. Separation, isolation, shame. That describes a lot of us in this country at this time as we confront our past and ponder our futures. As individuals, we have known our own experiences of shame and isolation and alienation. They become acute for most of us, I would say, in our teenage years. And in our teenage years, some of those barriers seem insurmountable. Barriers of discomfort and comfort. The barriers between shame and welcome. The barrier between alienation and inclusion. As I thought back on my teenage years, my my time of great shame was Algebra 2. Now, there's, there's a story here, of course. And, and I, don't mean, I don't mean to be, I'm, and I, I really, really don't mean to be flippant, okay? Although I sounded flippant. In junior high, I had tested really high in math, okay? And I got to Algebra 2. It wasn't working for me. But here's the shame and, the shame and isolation part. My teacher was Ronald Rice, who had been at high school with my mom. My grandfather had established the honors program at my high school, of, of, of which I was a member, and was a math teacher. My family had really high expectations of me, and I was not meeting them, and I was deeply ashamed 
And I didn't know how I would tell my mom. I never told my granddad. I didn't know Psalm 130 then, but had I, I probably, as a 10th grader, could have cried out, out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. I'm not getting this. Now to that sort of a teenager, to that teenage angst, turn up the heat a bit. Sexual identity. Because I don't have a television, I don't have a reference of Bruce Jenner as a reality TV dad. I don't have any of that. Um, what I have is, um, what I remember is from my younger days, from the Olympics and from the Wheaties cereal boxes, and now what I read in the checkout counters, or, um, or where I get my news, the New York Times, the BBC, NPR, Al Jazeera America. After Bruce became Caitlin, and I read Jenner's story of trying to match body and identity, of shame and confusion, I was very uncomfortable. I wondered how I would have managed it. How do teens who do not fit into the expectation of family and friends make it safely to adulthood? How does it feel to live as a taboo in your own flesh? Out of the depths I have called to you. There are barriers that cannot be breached or crossed, and yet with hope, with hope, we wait and hope like watchmen for the morning. In this country, in our cities, we wait and hope for changes of heart, for changes of behavior, for flags to come down, for people to take to heart the good news of welcome and grace and forgiveness. Hope. Can you imagine Psalm 130 on the lips of Jairus in Mark's gospel or in the heart of that unnamed woman with the issue of blood? Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord, heal my daughter, save her life. Out of the depths, I cry, O Lord, heal me, make me clean. Jairus was an established leader in his synagogue. He may have been quite accustomed to sitting at the best places at table, and yet he runs to get this itinerant teacher to beg for the life of his daughter. The woman, nameless in our story, by virtue of her illness, by virtue of the law of Torah, is unclean. For 12 years, for 12 years she has been isolated, alienated, and by the time she approaches Jesus, she is destitute, having spent all that she has seeking healing for her condition. Imagine if you have a child, if you've had a child, that child on the day of first grade, sending them off to school, and at the conclusion of the 12th grade, at graduation. That seems like a really long time, doesn't it? That's how long this unnamed woman was shut out of her family and her community because she was considered unclean. That long time, isolated. Out of the depths of her isolation, she calls and Jesus crosses the barrier of gender, Torah uncleanness, taboo upon taboo, heals her, and then begins the process of restoring relationships. This woman who has no name, he calls daughter. This woman who has been without her family, he calls daughter. O oh, Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, which she knew full well.
Out of the shadows she steps, recognized, valued, a daughter. Jairus' daughter dies, and Jesus crosses another barrier, another Torah taboo. He touches a corpse and then raises her up. Talithe kum, little girl, get up. With the Lord, there is plenteous redemption. Our country has been, in this week and a half, a country of wailing, a country of exaltation, a country of much commotion, a country that sounds like that community that gathered around Jairus's house and said, oh, don't bother the teacher anymore. The news alerts on my cell phone have been nonstop buzz, 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 buzz. No, just constant. In the midst of burying nine people shot in a lectionary Bible study, the Supreme Court makes same-sex marriage a nationwide right. Who imagined this could happen? There were many who waited and hoped like watchmen for the morning. I don't think that any of us expect that a ruling from the Supreme Court is going to heal the division in this country surrounding sexual preference, gender identity, or marriage equality any more than a Supreme Court decision 50 years ago healed racial division. While the Episcopal Church managed to stay together and not divide at the time of the Civil War, unlike some denominations, the Episcopal Church in America did worship in segregated parishes. You could often identify the black parishes by the name of the saint after which the parish was named. Augustine or Philip, some saint, identified with Africa. In the 90s, I served in Coconut Grove at St. Stephen's. Three blocks away is Christ Church, the Bahamian Church. For decades, one has served white folks and the other black folks. While I served at St. Stephen's, I learned from the rector why so many of the day schools in Southeast Florida were at that time celebrating their 40th anniversaries. They had been established soon after desegregation. The Supreme Court issued a decision and white Episcopalians wanted a place where their children could learn in a segregated setting. The Supreme Court ruling 50 years ago didn't heal racism in this country, or poverty, or stupidity, or meanness, or terror. The Supreme Court ruling on Friday won't heal us either. Both have been starting points. People leave churches for all sorts of reasons. Well do I know. Folks have departed the Episcopal Church and, in fact, this parish because we have sought to be welcoming and healing, crossing barriers and boundaries that were heretofore taboo, like the depths, like the Leviathan. It is scary. We cry out, some of us, my church, my society, it's changing. We cry out, some of us, I am weary of being shut out. I'm weary of being isolated. I want to be welcomed. I want relationship. I want to be whole. This is what I learned in my lectionary Bible study this week. I learned from the Greek in the gospel, sozo. It is the word that's used for healing. It is also used in the gospel for wholeness, for salvation. When someone is healed, there is wholeness, there is salvation. When the woman cried out, she received a bodily healing, but also her first relationship in 12 years, a wholeness. She was still destitute. She still had to reconstitute her life. 
Jesus didn't wave a magic wand. She still had to figure out how she was going to live, but she knew a wholeness that had eluded her for 12 years. The 12-year-old girl was raised up from death, and yet she still had ahead of her the hard life of a woman who lived in occupied Palestine. This is what I learned from Jairus and the woman with the hemorrhage in my lectionary Bible study this week. And when they approached Jesus from out of the depths, they did so with humility, from a posture of obeisance. Both of them fell to the earth. I learned to begin my profound requests from there and that Jesus raises me up and makes me whole. It is in relationship with Jesus that I can stand in the fullness of who I am and be whom I am called to be. This is what I learned from Jesus in my Bible study this week, that there are barriers and bound boundaries set by culture and law and religion and Jesus came to cross them, to break them down, and to leave healing and wholeness in their place. And he calls us to do likewise. And this is what I learned yesterday as I was preparing to begin the five o'clock liturgy, as I was scrabbling around on my desk trying to get the papers together. I learned that the general convention of the Episcopal Church our governing body elected a man of color to be the 27th presiding bishop of the church on the first ballot, a first for both. Preach it, hear it, I want to hear it. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> out of the depths, out of the depths we call upon the Lord like watchmen for the morning, we wait upon Jesus. With him, there is plenteous redemption. With him, there is healing and wholeness. With him, thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>